Today I want to explore with you if it's worth learning Alexia in 2024 or if you should concentrate on different languages. Also, I want to demonstrate my learnings that I had while rewriting a server from Python to Alexia. But first, let's grab a coffee and get started. Hi, I'm Arwin, and on this channel, I try to explore new languages, new tools, and new setups to optimize my work and to be faster. I always really enjoy exploring new languages, especially functional languages. And um, you may also saw it on other videos that I really appreciate Elm and try to find new ways of solving problems. It's always good to stay updated and learn new languages, especially as a software developer, to just continue like your journey and explore new techniques and problems. Because most of the time, new languages rise from a problem that needs to be solved. So all of the languages we have out there exist for a reason. They exist to solve a specific problem and I really love to understand the problem that people have, learn these new languages and understand why they created these languages to solve what problem and especially to yeah, to, to become more knowledgeable and to add another tool to my toolbox. So if you only know Python, every problem needs to be solved with Python. If you know Java, you solve everything with Java and I try to use the perfect language for the perfect job or use the, the, the right language for the job to solve it in the best way I can. Also, it's highly worth checking out new languages just for learning the new concepts and learning new ways of solving problems. Because if you only have a hammer, everything becomes a nail. Um, but if you add more tools to your toolbox, you can solve more problems in a better way. And especially functional languages are close to my heart because I'm a big fan of functional programming. And Alexia is running on the Beam or the Erlang VM. And if you believe Joe Armstrong, it might be the only object-oriented programming language that got it right. If you want to know what exactly I mean with object-oriented programming language, check out the video about Java I made because Java is not really an object-oriented programming language, even so it, yeah, it is referred to object-oriented programming language. Yeah, and as I said, Alexia is a functional programming language, so everything becomes immutable. And uh, what do I mean by immutable? Let's take a look at, at code. Uh, so for example, here we have a JavaScript array that contains numbers from one to four. And then we create a function that takes an array and a value, and it basically pushes the value to the array. And if we now run the function, we see before we have one, two, three, four, and afterwards we have the same array with one, two, three, four, five. So we basically we mutate the array inside the function. So if we want to change this function to a functional approach, we would create a new array. So let's say uh, new array, new ar equals, and then we take the old array, copy over the values, add the new array, and return this. So just return it instantly because it doesn't make any sense. We Re returned it. And if we now run the same function again, we see it's still run to three, four after the run. So what we need to do is basically resign the value again, and then we have the same behavior as before. But the function is side effect free. So whatever you give into the function, it will not be changed it will just return a new value of it. And this is basically the idea of immutability. And in Alexia, you cannot do the same thing. So you can only return a new value. If you create an array, as same as before, with the same values, then we create the function. So basically, this is a function. We take the array, we take the new value and we return the array plus the new value. So basically we mm, add the new value to the array. Um, and if we now run the function, so we inspect the value before, we run the new function and then we log it again. So let's uh, run the Alexia function. In this case, we use Alexia script just to make it faster in like changing the values and run it. Um, we see it's still one, two, three, four, even so uh, we updated it in here 
because we cannot update it. And one thing you have to know in Elixir, always the last well, like the last line of the function is the value that will be returned. So what we need to do now, if we want to update the array or if we want to create a new array, we can override the value. So now we have the updated value in here and have the same behavior as before. But the array itself is immutable. You can just reassign uh, values, but you cannot mutate them. You, you cannot push one value to the array. You need to create a copy of the array with the new uh, value of it. So yeah, this is the whole mutability concept. So one other feature that I really enjoyed using while rewriting the server is the pattern matching. You can have the fruit and then you use the case of the fruit. So it's basically a switch case in this example, but it matches on the pattern. So you can have uh, different patterns in here. So you can combine the values in, in on the top. Uh, you can have like the default, it's an underscore, it ignores basically the value. Um, you can also write the value in here, uh, fruit value, value for example, and then use it in here is the banana. So you can also use it like that and use the value. So this one would match always. You can also have the pattern matching based on functions. So you could, for example, define a module that has the same function twice. And you say, okay, call this test function when the value in it matches a specific uh, implementation or has the specific Boolean value that matches. So for example, we say the A must be more than 18 or A must be less than 18. So you can have multiple uh, functions in here. You can also have some pattern matching in here. So for example, it matches a specific atom, a specific structure. So you only allow specific structures into your function and you can have multiple implementations of the same function uh, with different pattern matching values. What I really love is the atoms. This is basically an atom. It can be okay or error or whatever you write there. Okay and error is quite often used. Um, and then later you can use the atoms, for example, as well for the pattern matching. So you can have like case test um, do, and then you can match on the pattern. For example, you can say, uh, okay, comma value goes to io.inspect and uh, you can have so you can also uh, match on these patterns basically and the case will be called, like if the test is an okay, it will be match this one. And if it's an error, it will match this one. So you can have these pattern matching, uh, especially handy with atoms in combination, uh, some feature that I really enjoy using. Yeah, in the beginning, I found these atoms a bit weird, but they, yeah, you get really fast used to it. And it's a feature that is used quite commonly over the whole language and many libraries, for example, the request library, uh, let me show you the request library. You also uh, you find these patterns as well. So you call the request and against a specific URL, and the response will be this pattern matching, and it will have like an error or uh, with the with the error code or the OK with the response, and this can be used then for switch cases later on. Yeah, here also you see the the types. You have the OK and the response type or the arrow and the exception type. Probably you know the concept as well from Go that you have like two returns, the OK and the error uh, return. But in, in, in Elixir, you have this pattern matching. This is for me at least a bit nicer because then you just have uh, the, you define the two paths. Like if it's an error, I, you know this is an exception, you can handle it. And if it's an OK, you know it's an it's okay and you can handle the response and you can also pattern match into the response. And if you or can have multiple patterns on the response, for example, the response can be okay, but still an, um, some error inside. So you can have like different codes, right? So different status codes and on go, you have to explicitly check the error and then 
continue. So for me, this pattern matching is a bit more useful or handy or a bit more natural uh, while coding um, because you often return as well as a case. So as you saw here, so the case also returns, right? So you can also use this as a return value in here, for example, then you know, okay, in an arrow case, I return uh, this value and in an okay case, I return this value for, from the function. So this is a bit more clear and more structured for me at least. So I, I really enjoy the coding part here. But still, there are a few things that I am not a big fan of or that I don't enjoy. So in the beginning, if you take a look at the documentation, it's a bit complicated to understand. So for example, you know, okay, you call this and you get an okay response, but not every time, right? You can have also an error, then it throws. And so there are multiple concepts that in the beginning at least are super overwhelming and it's very hard to understand especially when you read the documentation, you see something like this as like, what the heck, I can have a keyword and options and some responses and what do these mean? So in, in the beginning, it's a bit complicated and especially uh, these specs here, uh, it is not need necessary. So you can annotate your functions with the spec and this is something I would really, really recommend because when you annotate these specs, it basically tries to type and tries to understand if something can match or not. If you type spec your, your functions in the code, you will see that the language server sees, uh, understands some cases and say, okay, this cannot match because from the type spec, it is impossible you because you match on an uh, fine, for example, instead of an okay, and it says fine does is not um, something that this function can return. So it will show you these hints. That's why I highly recommend using the, the specs here. Um, but still, it's a dynamic language, like it can happen that it won't conform these specs in your own code. So be cautious on the specs, try to use them as much as possible. So this is something I learned while rewriting the server, that the specs can help you a lot. And that this also helps you a lot while during the auto completion and during the coding in, in general, the language server is quite good if you use the specs. But if you don't use it, it is just a variable. So the language server just say to you, okay, this is a variable. I don't know what it is, but this is a variable. Variable. It's a dynamic language as, as JavaScript. You may know this, and uh, it can sometimes shoot you in the foot. So if if an error happens, it will only kill this one process and not the whole application. In this, um, yeah, you can supervise this with a supervisor pattern, and then the the process will be restarted. Um, and yeah, there are different concepts and I'm not that deep yet in the language, but there's a ton of stuff that comes out of the box that um, will be handled for you. Processes are super lightweight and this is also the reason why it is used in many telecommunication systems. For example, WhatsApp is running on Erlang uh, because of these lightweight processes that can handle thousands of requests per second. And it is super resilient. These processes can crash. It doesn't matter. It will be spin up again and try it again. And the footprint while idle is also super small. So all in all, it's a language that is designed for many small requests that has a high throughput. And yeah, it's, it's basically used for messaging systems also brings a lot of tooling with it for these uh, telecommunication systems. These libraries are quite wide used. Uh, all in all, they are okayish documented. Uh, while coding in, in Alexia, I found myself quite often using ChatGPT. Uh, ChatGPT works quite okayish, I would say. Many things were just wrong typed. This is something that I saw really often on ChatGPT if I ask for a solution. It gave me somehow a solution, but it was really often wrong and I had to find a way around it. And yeah, but it gave me the right direction and the right hint to Google further. Um, in the end, I found myself using the specs quite often, but mostly to be honest, the examples. So the examples in the specs are really good. If you go into the details of uh, the specs, for example, here, check some, you always have a quite good example how to use it. Um, but all in all, 
this is like the request library at least is a really good documented one. It's sometimes quite hard to understand libraries in the beginning of the language. And there, ChatGPT helped me quite a lot. Is it worth it? Still really good question. If you take a look at the survey, um, many people admire Alexia. So here we have Alexia. It's, I think, the second place from all the admired languages. So the only language that is more admired is Rust. Obviously, Rust is amazing. I love Rust. Um, but Alexia is the second place as the admired language but it is very little desire. So very few people want to learn it still. I think it's worth learning at least for the concepts and having it in your toolbox, but you have to put this in perspective. So 73% admire the language, but in professional use, we have only a few percent on Alexia here, 2.3% use Alexia professionally, professional developers, Alexia 2.6%. So really few people use it professionally. The 73% laugh needs to be put into perspective of how few people use it. So this is something you need to keep in mind if you see it. Yes, a lot of people using it love it, but there are only a few people using it. And this is also something I saw in the community. The community is really strong, but it's only a few people. So you get to know people quite fast. I think it's a very nice community. The people are really nice. And yeah, it's, it's, a nice, it's nice to be part of the Alexia community for sure. And I definitely want to stay into this and use it more often. WhatsApp is built on Erlang. Discord uses Alexia. So we have already many applications that has this high throughput that use Alexia but you can have the same speed as well with other languages, right? So you don't need to use Alexia to have like a super performant application. You can achieve these high throughputs as, as well with other languages. Instagram is using Python, so even Python can be fast. It's probably just a bit more complicated to have the same speed and the same, uh, yeah, the same speed of processes in other languages. Alexia brings quite a lot of these building blocks already in the language. Other languages, you have to create them in your own if you want to have them super performant. I mean, Python, you have tons of libraries out there, but they are probably not as performant as the few Alexia libraries you have. I definitely wouldn't, would suggest you learning Alexia in 2024 as well. It's definitely something um, I learned quite a lot from. So while rewriting the Python server into an Alexia server, I encountered way less bugs. Uh, this is probably also because of the rewrite. So it's often way easier to rewrite. I did not maintain yet the, uh, the Alexia server too much. So I cannot talk in the long run. It's only three weeks now that I am writing Alexia code. One thing you need to keep in mind if you do it because of the money. Ah, yeah. One thing as well in the <laughs> in the Stack Overflow survey, uh, Alexia was also one of the highest paid language. So Zig is higher, Erlang is second place, and Alexia is third place in the high paying languages. But also you need to put this in perspective of the 2.6% using it professionally. So yes, you can earn quite a lot of money but it's very hard to find a job in Alexia. And this reflects also my research or yeah, I looked it up on LinkedIn. So if you type in Alexia in LinkedIn, you see uh, there are 15 results for Alexia jobs in Germany. On the other hand, React 6.5 thousand jobs. So yeah, it's way easier probably to find a job in React but if you find a job in Alexia, you probably will be higher paid. And with that, I would say, check it out. Try Alexia. Give me some feedback. Did you write uh, Alexia in the past? How was your experience learning Alexia? Let me know down in the comments. Would love to hear it. And with that, I would suggest, yes, learn Alexia in 2024. Do not learn it for job opportunities. Do not learn it because you think it's the best language out there. Learn it for the sake of learning a new language, learn it for extending your toolkit, extending your knowledge. Uh, for me, it was 
a lot of fun writing Elixir code. I really enjoy Elixir as a language. With that, happy coding. Try it out yourself. Let me know down in the comments and see you soon.